All right, so today I thought I'd do something a little bit different and give you more of a vlog style video, kind of like a day in the life of a snake breeder. And it's kind of interesting. I actually kind of have different schedules, different times of the year. So this time of year, I'm actually advertising some of my hatchlings over on Morph Market and I ship out on Mondays. So today is Monday. It's been a pretty busy day. So pretty much to start my day, what I do is I go through all the sales of my snakes and figure out who's paid in full and whose you know snake is ready to ship and then you have to figure out kind of the logistics you have to make sure someone is on the receiving end so you don't end up shipping and then the snake stays there it's, it's like an overnight shipping and then I have to figure out if the temperature is right on either end and if I need a heat pack or not which this time of year I actually need a heat pack and then essentially what I do is I box them up and bring them down to Denver to the FedEx ship center and it's actually an hour away so I drive all the way down to Denver ship the snakes and of course you know I want to make the use of that trip so on the way back then I stop at the feed store and buy some straw for my cows for bedding and then I stop at Safeway and get some dog food for my dogs on the way back home and I got a lot of other stuff going on here in my reptile room I kind of just want to take you around and show you some of the stuff that I'm working on here today all right, so the first thing I want to show you is my incubator. I actually built this incubator out of a beverage cooler. This is where I hatch all of my snake eggs. And I kind of wanted to show you real quick kind of what's going on with my incubator. So it's been shut down all season. I'm about a month away before I actually get some eggs. So I kind of wanted to crank this up and I can kind of show you how I have this set up and the funny thing is is I actually have these thermostats and I didn't have enough thermostats at the time when I shut this down so I moved this thermostat over on my hatchling rack and then when I got rid of all my hatchlings I used that thermostat for a reptile show and I'm kind of moving this around I finally bought a couple more thermostats so I can actually run thermostats on everything now and I'm not always fighting so essentially what I do is let me kind of show you I actually have these heat strips three of them on the side and then I plug all my heat strips into a controller like this and then what I do is I run this controller directly into the thermostat right here so this actually controls all three heat strips and then I have a plug in the back with a probe on it and I take the probe and I attach it <laughs> see it's kind of all tangled up here so I actually attach the probe directly to the hottest heat map that's the way I have it set up so I kind of set it up under here so I can actually read the temperature and then I'll take the probe and I'll kind of run it right up along like right in here and I'll attach it directly to the this is the hottest one so actually when I first turn it on you can actually take a temperature of all of them these two on the sides get hotter than the one on the back so you definitely want to attach the probe directly to the hottest one right there and then what I do is I just plug this in right into a power strip I have a power strip right in the wall here and that turns on my thermostat and then what I do is I have this little fan here this circulates the air from the top and the bottom you definitely don't want to plug this fan into the one over here you can see this one is actually pulsing you can see the light kind of coming on and off as it pulses the temperature from the probe sometimes it pulses sometimes it stays on depending on what setting you have on your thermostat and then I kind of stick this fan right in the back and it pushes the air up and kind of circulates the whole thing it's a pretty pretty good fan there and then I just plug this right into the main power strip, which is this one right here that the, the heat controller is plugged into. And then this plugs into the wall. And then what I do, this, this is kind of a really neat little incubator. You can actually take these wires and put them right along the corner of the door and kind of set them right in there, just like that. And it kind of, clamps them in there a little bit but it seals it right on the corner so that is set up and then the funny thing is is let me show you my heat probes i've been having a problem with these with these heat probes so <laughs> the funny thing is take a look at this i actually bought this heat probe uh this is like like a temperature probe that i bought on amazon and i actually bought two of these with two probes a piece 
And the funny thing is, <laughs> I actually took this and I put one on my fridge and then I put these in my two freezers in my garage. And the funny thing is, is for some reason, since this is the same brand, every now and then, the one from my kitchen will actually all of a sudden pick up one of these probes and it'll read 65 and the alarm will go off. It's because this probe is down here. So these are kind of useless to me because they're interfering with the other unit that is exactly like this. It looks like I'm gonna have to figure out some other kind of a, a probe in here. So essentially what I do on these is I put them on all the different corners in the top and the bottom. I kind of map the whole thing and figure out where the hot spots are. And if it's not even, if I get some really outliers, I'll change the fan or I'll change the configuration so I get an even temperature through the whole incubator. All right, so that was my incubator. I wanna move on to my big snakes, and this is Lucy. And I thought for sure Lucy was building eggs and getting big, and I thought she was gonna lay. And the funny thing is, is <laughs> she's come back on food. Ate a couple of really big rats, and actually, if you kinda of, kind of move along the glass here, <laughs> when I first came over here, she was like looking, pacing back and forth, looking for another rat. I don't think she's gonna lay eggs. Usually, if they're getting close to laying eggs, they stop eating eating and they won't start back up again. So the, the fact that this girl is starting to eat again, she pro I'm thinking she probably won't lay eggs this year, which is a bummer. So probably what I'll do is I'll feed it really heavy until this next season. This will be, I think this will be the fifth year. <laughs> She's going to be like five years old. Hopefully she'll actually breed this year. This is a white albino uh, uh, part Jampea dwarf. She's 50% Jampea dwarf, 50% mainland. She's a really big snake. I'd say she's probably, I think the last time I waited she's about 85 pounds so I was really hoping for a big clutch of eggs I don't think I'm gonna get it this year so Lucy is my female reticulated python. I actually have a male too that's part super dwarf. And this guy's come back in food. You really have to watch these retics when they go back in feeding mode because they can come lunging out of these tubs. And you never know what kind of a mood they're gonna be in. This guy actually ate uh, one really super large, super jumbo rat and he looks like uh, it's not really flying out of the top, so I really don't have to worry about it. And it's kind of funny when these guys go into breeding mode, they'll both fast for a really long time. This guy got super, super skinny. And finally, he's at a point where he's going back on food, which is really awesome. It's always awesome to get him back on food. I really want to pound a lot of rats into this guy because, you know, if he, he kind of goes in that breeding mode, if you don't have enough weight in him, you can tell he even still looks pretty thin. And this guy, is a little bit skittish sometimes uh it's, it's a little bit dicey going into this tub it's he was kind of a really wild uh the reticulated python when he was younger he used to snap at me all the time he's gotten a lot better and i'm getting more confident actually handling this guy all right, so I wanna give you a quick update on my rats. These are all my rat tubs over here, and then I have a couple rows of mice up on the top, and these feed all my snakes, and mostly my ball pythons, but my reticulated pythons in particular, they use up all my older retired rats that are pretty much, they only usually last about a year, year and a half, maybe up to two years, and then if I don't feed them off, they start dying. This week I actually lost three rats. I think it was from old Old age where they actually just you know just got too old and they passed away and since so what I do is when the when the retics are coming back on food you can tell take a look at this guy right here let me see if I can <laughs> single this one guy out these are they're not really I don't think they'll bite me I really don't like to pick them up by their tail is as, as little as possible but they're not real friendly rats they're not pet rats these these are like kind of on the borderline of wild rats but you can definitely tell like the really big male like right here he's like pretty much at the end of his life and if you actually keep them as really old rats for too long they just die of old age and I kind of like to try to feed them to my retics the problem is with my retics 
they tend to get to the point where you know they they're going off of food because of the breeding season sometimes they can go off of food for months and months and then I really don't like to euthanize my rats just to put them in the freezer so essentially what I do is I wait until the retics are feeding again and then kind of go through and call out all my rats look at that one <laughs> the rats are pretty cool too I don't really you know like to euthanize them uh, they're almost like pets that's why I don't like to kind of go through and I, I pretty much just let them live out their life some of the old retired breeders and then if my retics are eating a lot of times what I'll do is you know I'll go through and just call the ones that I think are almost ready to die you can kind of get a feel for which ones are like right on the edge they're really super old but if you don't keep up with it you definitely lose quite a few rats dying from old age so here's another thing that I've kind of been pondering. I'm wondering if this is okay or not. Let's take a look at this. So if, for example, if I open up this tub on the pinstripe pie, this is one of the females that I'm actually breeding. And always with this coconut husk, it seems like it dries out a little bit. You can tell this is a little bit on the edge where I need to go through and spot clean all these. I'm pretty much getting ready to go through and spot clean them all. But the problem is, is they get a little bit of coconut husk in the water. And sometimes it turns into like a tea consistency and I was wondering if it's okay for snakes to actually drink that tea looking kind of you know with the coconut husk and the water kind of mixed together because I've seen a lot of snakes actually in there drinking that with the coconut husk in there I'm not sure 100% that it's actually good for the snake because if you get too much in there it can actually mold you can see a little bit of mold in there so it's, it's really tough to stay up on top of all these tubs and keep all the coconut husk especially on all the tubs that I have and you know eventually it's, it's almost impossible you can actually go to a paper substrate which is it has pros and cons for paper and you never contaminate the water like this with the coconut husk but I was wondering if it's okay you know for the snake to actually drink this water it seems like it's been working fine I don't really have I've never really had any six snakes and it seems to be working okay it's just kind of one of the things I ponder as I'm going through working with the snakes so another thing I thought I'd show you is one of Bobby's babies. I just have one left. Someone actually did this on a payment plan. Put some money down and let's see if I can actually get him out of here and show you. This guy, his name is Sparky. He is a bamboo, one of Bobby's babies. Looking really good from last year. I actually should produce a lot more this year. I'm hoping to produce a lot more of these bamboos for you know people to buy this year the, i'm actually breeding a lesser bamboo to a whole bunch of normals uh, hopefully some of those will go and i'll get a bunch more bamboos these are really awesome looking snakes that is really fantastic all right so it is time for the question of the day and real carolina outdoors asks if you breed two 100% head pods together, what is the percentage of the offspring? And that is a very good question. Essentially, the offspring would be 66% head pied. They would actually have a 66% chance that they would get one copy of the pie gene. And here is where it gets a little bit confusing. Let's take it one step further. So for example, if you actually had two snakes that were 50% head pied, both of them had a 50% chance of being head pied. You bred them together, kind of looking forward, you would think that the offspring would be, uh, it would be a possible head pied. Because you don't know if one or the other actually carries the head pied. You don't really know. But if you actually bred them together and you produced a visual, now you know for sure that each one has one copy of the pie gene those 50 percent become 100 percent and then all the ones that aren't visual pieds will actually be 66 percent head pied it's a little bit confusing if you can actually follow my logistics kind of through the head pieds and the possible heads so that is pretty much it thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video